Welcome to We Are Libertarians, where our goal is to help you sound smarter while talking to your friends. My name is Chris Spangle. We examine current events from a libertarian perspective while treating modern politics with all of the irreverence it deserves. We toss out the screaming heads and put people before political parties and give context to the news. This is a special series on We Are Libertarians called The Swamp Explain. And I am joined by my friend Rob Cortell, a 45-year fly on the wall in Washington, D.C. Rob has worked for Republican presidential campaigns, government agencies like the EPA, and has been confirmed by the Senate to the U.S. Federal Maritime Commission. He's also been a candidate for Congress and Senate. And given his experience and iconoclastic viewpoints, Rob gives us an insight into the swamp that makes up our nation's capital. Uh, adding in a little music this time, just a little production elements. Uh, so it is so good to have my friend Rob here. Rob, how are you doing today? Oh, I am doing fine. We're having a lot of amusing times these days, aren't we? Oh, it's it's <laughs> never a dull moment. You know, so one of the things about an election year and why we've been literally behind the scenes prepping for two years for this year, you know, our downloads go from, it went from 2,000 to 10,000, <laughs> like a single yeah. year an episode because people get so curious. It's like they wake up. It's like spring hits every presidential election. People start waking up to politics. So it's very interesting what, you know, are you getting a lot more people going, hey, well, who's this guy? How's this working? What do you think about this? I, I'm getting a lot more eye rolling. <laughs> <to be. laughs> really? You know, I, uh, you know I, of course, I'm around both Republicans and Democrats and disgusted Republicans and all of that. And, and, uh, it, just like they say on TV, there are an awful lot of people who are uh, who would love to find a reason to vote against Trump, and um, but they they're wary of uh, Bernie, and so it's it's kind of interesting. It's a great time. I think of course, I've been on the other side of this so many times, you know. So <laughs> not having anybody to vote for. Yeah. Well, and 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 you know, one of the big topics, of course, you know, after the debate, which we should talk about too, was the idea of a brokered convention. So. You know, way back when, in 1976, I was uh, with Ford, and uh, we did not have the votes going in. Remember, that was Reagan uh, was very close, and um, we did not know that whether the president would come out of it with the nomination or not. Mm. Uh, and we were, boy, we were fighting for every single um, delegate. I I was preparing individual briefing books on every single delegate who was. Um, who was undecided or supposedly undecided. We, of course, had several chairmen. Uh, I think Clark Reed was really the pivotal guy down in uh, uh, Mississippi or Missouri. I can't remember which one, one of the M's in the South. And uh, Clark controlled quite a, a delegation then that could have put us over. And the fact that we, we were able to get him at the last minute, uh, that's how Ford won. But I'll tell you, it was nip and tuck and holding your breath all the way. They were... Uh, it's kind of Faustian bargains. Uh, um, uh, Reagan announced he was going to uh, have uh, Schweiker, who was a, a then considered a somewhat liberal senator from Pennsylvania, as his VP candidate before the convention. That was a tactical maneuver on his part. To and let me pause. So just to introduce for the younger folk, uh, Ronald Reagan actually ran for president in 1976 against sitting President Gerald Ford for the nomination. We actually right. just uh, t did an interview with Dan Mitchell, who was a former Cato scholar, who was the issues guy for the Reagan campaign. So oh, I, asked him, I asked him if he had he had heard of you and he said, uh, it doesn't ring a bell. But so it's like dual yesterday and today, it's dueling campaigns from the 76 campaign. Dueling so, memories. Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, and how, I, how I was running long? the issue side from the Ford campaign and and yeah. uh, and uh, uh uh, there was really not a lot of contact, you know, at all. It was really enemy camps. So right. I'm not surprised. And when, uh, um, and I, to this, you know, even when Reagan did get the nomination in, um, in uh, 1980, uh, I, I could not bring myself to walk across and, and uh, join the campaign. But hmm. I, I, as you know, I came to later came to decide that he was actually pretty good and the right guy at the right time for a number of reasons that are, we can talk about some other time. Yeah, let's ex let's flesh this out a little bit because that's an interesting perspective that not a lot of people will, I'm sure, get. Because, I mean, I'm 36. I don't think I've ever seen a contested uh, convention in my lifetime. Not that I can think of. And I've been a pretty active watcher since the 92 campaign, uh, maybe even the 88 campaign a little bit. Um, but 
why did Reagan decide to run in 76 and how brutal was, was that? And, and what does a contested convention look like after a, a long well, Reagan, like Reagan had actually been thinking about running since 68 uh, mm -hmm. against Nixon. And, uh, and in 72, he kind of made a little noise. And so he just saw 76 as his opportunity and Jerry Ford is an accidental president. And um, uh, so uh, it wasn't necessarily bad timing on his part, uh, but I, I think he became president because he did not get the nomination. I think if he had, he, he would, I think he would have lost without doubt to Jimmy Carter in 76 uh, because of, uh, you know, Carter sort of represented change. And um, so in historically he was lucky to have lost that, but it was, it was a fight. I mean, it was bare knuckles, uh, uh, every single delegate was scrapped for the, the promises made. Uh, 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 Trump, I mean, uh, Ford basically uh, uh, tossed uh, Nelson Rockefeller over the cliff and um, for uh, Dole. And um, uh, although Dole was nominated at, at convention. Uh, in, in what way? So was Dole running or what was the... No, Dole wasn't running. Basically what happened was... Um, you know, you had uh, Reagan from the right saying that Ford was too moderate, too liberal, too moderate. And of course, Nelson Rockefeller represented the, the Northeastern Republicans, quote, liberal. And um, and so Trump, I mean, uh, Ford dumped Nelson, who'd only been his VP for about a year and a half, uh, two years maybe, and uh, went in the convention sort of free to make a deal on that. And then, mm. you know, Bob Dole was senator from Kansas and a war hero and from World War II. So he, he was sort of a natural, although um, later on in the campaign, uh, once Ford had won the nomination against Carter, of course, Dole was then blamed partly for the downfall of the campaign in one of his <laughs> debates. Well, it, it, he, um, he, he uh, uh, there were a number of incidents. I mean, he really wasn't responsible for any of that, but the, the campaign would get momentum and then something would happen and kind of stop and then get momentum and something would happen and kind of stop. And, uh, for example, his Secretary of Agriculture, Earl Butts, um, made some kind of foot and mouth remark and was had to had to resign in the middle of it. That stopped us dead in our tracks. Uh, uh, Ford himself um, made a remark in the last debate. He was asked about um, um, the cap the so-called captive nations. The, it's a series of small countries which are now independent uh, on the the western side, western and south. Western side of Russia, um, all of those countries, Lithuania, et cetera. And the official U.S. position was that they were not really captive and nor part of, they were, they were captive, but they were not part of Russia. And, and uh, he was asked a question about uh, um, whether uh, they, the con these con countries were free or should be free or something. And he totally muffed the answer. He gave the official U.S. position, which sounded pretty crappy to most of the public. And, um, and then Dole and his um, uh, thing, his debate basically uh, talked about Democrat wars with a, a big D Democrat party. And, you know, we Republicans have long referred to the Democratic party as the Democrat party. So not as to give them any advantage, I guess, psychologically mm -hmm. as being democratic. <laughs> and so, um, and that was uh, a major blow. You know, they, everybody jumped on it immediately that the, the wars had been bipartisan and so on and so forth. So, but it, it was, uh, it was quite a fight. And um, uh, I, I, I think, uh, I think the Democrats are in for their own fight. You know, that's only what five, five percent, maybe four or five yeah, percent so of delegates let, picked. Let me, let me go back and let me kind of tease that out before we go to that, because you just hit on something that is constantly playing out and i think people think oh this is a brand new development in politics but reagan is governor of california or has just left the governorship of california right. and was a very conservative person uh and the the idea that w was gerald ford a moderate i mean was ronald reagan super conservative i mean or was that just a convenient distinction that he could make you know, saying, oh, he's he's too weak because that idea of strong versus weak seems to continually play into politics. You know, a Bloomberg saying Bernie's too weak to run. He's right. too far left. I'm I'm the moderate choice. 
I mean, that, that idea seems to continually pop up in every single uh, election cycle. Well, I think it's particularly popped up in, in uh, the last uh, Democratic one. So, so Trump won, um, despite everybody looking at him saying he couldn't win, and but in, in part because of the whole change issue. And then I think Obama won um, uh, because of the change issue. And uh, uh, so... Uh, Bill Clinton won uh, because he was new and fresh. Jimmy Carter won because he was new and fresh. So uh, I think uh, if you look around at, you, ha- you look at contemporaneous events and uh, you have to, you're looking at two things. One, what are most voters turned off by rather than what they're turned on by? And then secondly, um, what are they motivated by? And, and those are not necessarily the same thing. So it's not always completely predictable, but you've got to, situation where you we've just gone through months a year two years of the democrats hammering on trump on impeachment and everything else and 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 losing on the uh, the the Mueller report and losing on impeachment and and uh in my opinion basically strengthening trump so remember impeachment remember when that it seemed so long ago oh yeah (laughs) well and i i have to say nancy pelosi is probably put the hammer down on those guys because you remember that immediately after everyone was talking about what are the next hearings and um and you had Schiff and everybody else threatening to do it and where has that gone just has disappeared and well you I look at some of the stone and the bill barr stuff and you you see the democrats yeah. salivating for another round of impeachment and you're just like guys what are you doing yeah but i i think i think pelosi's a shrewd operator i think she knows there's not a lot of percentage in it and I'd say that Barr has maneuvered himself around on that issue too. So, but I, I would not be surprised if they go into uh, brokered convention, but the, the, the twist on this, and uh, this is kind of links to the Russian interference, which is that um, essentially what the, the, the Russian uh, MO last time was to create, whip up a frenzy in social media around the notion that somehow the establishment was going to take it away from Trump and give it to Hillary. And and so that was a play on both sides. And um, they whipped up anti-Hillary stuff with the Sanders people by, again, it was the establishment has taken this away from you and, and then they lost Trump. And so, if anything, I have to believe that what the Russian interference right now on Sanders is doing is starting to whip up. The establishment's going to take it away from you again. You're going to go to a brokered convention. You're going to have the most delegates. And then they're, they're going to get these super delegates, 700 people, and steal it from you again. And, um, and, and of course, at the same time, they want to whip Sanders up as the candidate, either as the direct candidate which I, I'm beginning to believe could be a mistake for Trump uh, and or uh, for his people to stay home again or to vote for Trump like many of them did last time. So, uh, and, and by the way, watching the debate performance of both Sanders and Warren, um, I, I, uh, I think uh, their energy could conceivably overcome the disability of their positions on a lot of issues um, among people who, um, who want to take on Trump. So, I'm, I'm not sure that they would necessarily lose if they had the nomination. Yeah. So let's, there's a lot to unpack there. Let's start yeah. with, maybe let's start with the, the Russia stuff because yeah. in, in my mind, the, the media and uh, select Democrats way overplay the Russia hand to the point that it becomes uh, a joke to, I mean, I, someone sent me our, a Bernie bro on my Facebook had, had posted <laughs> several screenshots of, John Kennedy gets elected due to Russian inter- interference. Uh, Jimmy Carter right. pulled out to the Russians, uh, you know, and uh, Barack Obama is the favorite president of Putin. Like it's, it's a perennial line. And the idea that Donald Trump, I mean, as a person who works on Facebook for a living and is a social media marketer, I can tell you that $100,000 in ad spends on Facebook is not going to tip the election <laughs> in any direction. <laughs> yeah. It it barely can get you any downloads for your podcast. Uh, it's just a, it's a, a minimal amount. Are the Russians trying to interfere in our elections? Absolutely. They're trying to do what we do to them. But the, the 
the leaking of an anonymous intelligence official, you know, saying, oh, Trump's it, it's it seems like a pretense again for if Donald Trump wins reelection. He di- he only won the election because the Russians helped him and not because Hillary didn't campaign in three swing states or because the Democrats nominated Bernie. It never seems it seems like the Russians and tech companies have become the scapegoats for why the candidates that the elites hate get elected. Well, that's, I think that's right. But the you know, and, that they're making mistakes. But but n- neither intel- none of the intelligence agencies or Mueller um, uh, said uh, that that the Russian effort actually carried anyone over the line. And uh, in fact, th- they said you couldn't tell, but they didn't, you know, basically they didn't believe it. And I suspect that's true. But, you know, Trump um, is still smarting from losing the popular vote and he is a conspiracy theorist. So it's easy for him to, to uh, both mock and support conspiracy theories at the same time. So, right. so he, and he's correct that, the left and the Hillary people have just not given up. They, if, like a dog with a bone, they are not given up. He can't possibly have been legitimately elected. And, and, you know, he was, he won. And so they want to believe there's something there. Um, I, think, I think we all know that the Russian effort, and it's not just Russians, it's others, is real. You know, we've seen the Saudis in, engaged in it, and we know East Europeans, and in fact, um, uh, the Ukraine was involved at, at some level too. So, um, and, and social media is very powerful. I think the the it's most powerful in in, in ticking people off uh, enough to to engage continuously. I you know I have this running Twitter battle um, <laughs> on um, the Jones Act, my favorite topic, you know, and sort of right. reengage in that. And oh my God, the I can put something out and all the bad boys all come back at you. And, and of course I want to sit there and tweet back at them, which I will do sometimes, you know, back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And you think, Oh, I got to go eat lunch. (laughs) (laughs) I don't think it stops it. So, um, and there's an awful lot of research as you well know, MIT and Stanford and Harvard and all these other places and technology and Carnegie Mellon and on and on and on. Uh, it does have an influence and it is viral and that's, that's the problem. Um, and it has probably some modest influence on turnout, but in the end, uh, they, they, I, no one believes they actually did it last time. Are they more sophisticated this time? Who knows? And, and by the way, I think the public tends to think of it not so much in social media terms, but are they somehow uh, infecting our, uh, uh, the machinery of the election? Uh, and uh, I think, honestly, I'm much more worried about the machinery of the election being hacked than anything else. Yeah, meaning going into the to the online yeah. machines. Well, yeah. Just look how screwed up the the uh, Iowa caucuses were, and uh, the fact that in Nevada they had to basically ditch their uh, their uh, their app they were going to use and come up with something else, and still took them uh, too <laughs> much time to come up with let's results. Touch on that, because you and I, I've built an app, and I paid a lot more for my my app <laughs> for a radio show than i than the iowa people did like you work in technology too mm-hmm. like when you heard that they spent sixty three thousand dollars, i mean this is just this is why you cannot have online elections because the nature of government yeah. is they give the contract to the best politically connected not necessarily the best designers and they they built this app for sixty three thousand dollars with brand new coders what else did they expect to happen it just was laughable i mean from a yeah. technology perspective did you just cringe when you started to read the details of that? Well, yeah, um, and of course, uh, I don't know how much testing they did. It's really hard to test on the battlefield in the middle of the battle um, as to whether something works. The uh, but you know, it's you can screw up royally uh, on not just small things like that, but on big ones. Remember that there, if you go back to Romney versus Obama, Romney had this massive, massive data room operation inside a stadium or, uh, or some massive um, physical facility in, um, I think it was Boston, that was supposed to be monitoring uh, state by state, precinct by precinct, captain by captain, uh, and um, really goose people to, to try to move 
voters out and make sure they got to the polls and everything else. And it totally blew up in their face. And that was tens, that was millions of dollars. So um, I, I think the things like this, which are complex systems, uh, require a, a lot more effort than we think. They're not simple yes or no kinds of things. They're, they're complex, very organic, um, constantly evolving systems. And there are so many exogenous factors that affect What's going on? You just can't always control for it. So, you would think you could, but you it, you can't. So. That may be the biggest word ever used on We Are Libertarians. What was that like? Ex exogenous? Yeah. <laughs> that that, what does that, that mean? That means things outside of your zone that you can't control ah. that come at you. Like uh, the weather is an exogenous factor uh, for a farmer. Now he can love anticipate. It. He can anticipate it. He can prepare for it. He can remedy the effects of it, but he can't stop that rain cloud. Hmm. Not yet. So, so let's look at uh, the the candidates, the Democratic candidates. It is interesting to me yeah. that in 2020 we may have an election where an independent senator has the Democratic nomination, or a person who was a Republican five minutes ago turned Democrat <laughs> could be the nominee for the Democrats. Yeah. And Donald Trump, who was until about three years ago, a Democrat now turned Republican uh, as the Republican nominee. It, and Lord help me if the libertarian party screws this up and nominates some idiot, I will never <laughs> promote the libertarian party again, because this, this is shaping. Who, who, who's on the, who's on the lead there? I'm not even I don't even want to get into it because they're all so insane and <laughs> they're jokes. It's not even worth your time talking about the people that are that are running for president for the libertarians. I'm I'm really hoping Well maybe Lincoln, we have you have you run. Uh, maybe I could do better than any of these jokers. Uh, I'm hoping Justin Amash gets in. It's it's possible, yeah. but we'll we'll see. Yeah. Um well the next the, couple of weeks are going to really be something. Yeah, it's it's just you know the realities of needing us uh multi-party system in the united states is um it's it seems like it's fast approaching like i've always said political parties are empty vessels you fill it with whatever you want and we're seeing that result now but the parties may put up candidates in this in the fall that don't necessarily represent the majority of the united states and their beliefs i mean how did we get to this point well so i'm not sure i think um I'm not sure I think it's entirely predictable yet. I don't think there's enough data. Number one, um, I, I think Bernie has been winning partly on the young vote and his, his earlier followers, uh, whether that would translate into, whether he can translate momentum into something bigger than a narrow set of demographics, that's gonna be a key question. And whether he goes all the way, you know, like, you know, in the next week we have South Carolina, which is, maybe 50 ish, 54 delegates. And so Joe Biden is staking his all on that. Well, so Bernie won by, what was it this morning? It was 41% and uh, Biden was 19 and Buttigieg was um, 15. And I believe uh, Warren was 14 and Klobuchar, who I think is actually pretty good, was trailing behind that. And, and of course, Bloomberg wasn't even on the ballot. Um, but now we have South Carolina. And, and one of the things the commentators were saying today is, well, uh, 20 points is a major lead, and Biden's going to need 20 points in South Carolina. Well, I'm going to be stunned if he gets 20 points in South Carolina, yeah. except that I don't think Buttigieg has much of a following down there, although apparently he's spending a lot of money. Um, and, um, uh, and, and Amy Klobuchar, I don't think, has a lot of following down there. So I think in South Carolina, it's going to be um, – it's going to be uh, – uh, it's going to be a Biden, Sanders uh, – Probably, uh, well, Buttigieg will be making a strong play. I know Warren is still going to be hammering on that one. I think Steyer has put some money in it. And, of course, I don't think Bloomberg's on that ballot either. I, I, I don't uh, think he's been on a ballot yet. Yeah, I but think he is really, on Super Tuesday. Yeah. And, and a third of the delegates are going to be chosen on March 3rd. And that is just, that's a massive, massive undertaking. So I think I saw that um, he had spent... Uh, 140 million or something on Super Tuesday, and the next closest was uh, might have been Steyer at 30, and and then uh, I, I don't think uh, I don't think uh, 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 the rest of them spent 
probably five million. Well, I think Biden was a couple three million or something, and the rest of them combined are not three million dollars. Uh, so, but that yeah, ranges that's... from Alabama to you know California with like fifty and California with the four hundred and some and. Massachusetts to Minnesota, North Carolina, Tennessee. I mean, it's massive, massive distribution geographically. So, so that's where the power of advertising will be tested. I mean, Virginia's in that too. And I, I can already tell you that, um, that there, I, I run into more people who are moving their way over to Bloomberg in Virginia among Democrats and independent Republicans than anyone else. So, Why are they moving to him? What's the appeal? I, I think it's... Um, a uh, maybe it's an irrational search for someone who makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You know, it's. Uh, uh, I just think the um, uh, the reality is that that Bernie is is scary, and um, Elizabeth Warren is not uh, enough warm and fuzzy. I just don't. I think she's sort of lost her mo mojo, and I. I think Biden is feeling more and more tired, and um, and I've long thought it was probably Biden Klobuchar is the only only ticket that could beat Trump, uh, but conceivably Bloomberg could. You know, Bloomberg. Uh, I know people in his operation, and they are no doubt the most sophisticated um, uh, people in this game. They really understand, uh, and it is entirely digitally driven. Um, I will say they were, in my opinion, overconfident going into the debate. You know, I, uh, 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 my understanding is that they have been uh, practicing debating for weeks, if not months, and uh, thought they had every issue fleshed out. And, and uh, you know, the, the evening has started out, and it was pretty clear he didn't have any sea legs. And no, yeah. he, he performed poorly. I mean, Donald Trump. Although the most honest remark was when he said, you know, the main thing I'm thinking is that this is the most ridiculous scene I've ever seen, and it's only going to help elect Donald Trump. Yeah, yeah. or the, what a great country. I thought he the first hour he was just abysmal and didn't have yeah. any defense for himself. But then once they got into capitalism versus socialism, I felt he really exposed Bernie as sort of a weird-looking kook and – he, he got under Bernie's skin. Bernie was very prickly and yeah. seemed agitated. And I felt, I think B Bernie Sanders, I, that was the only debate that I've watched in full so far. And Sanders seemed like he was the worst in terms of being able to fight back because he took it all too personally. And he would do terribly in a debate with Donald Trump where everybody else kind of had some fight. Actually, I, I came away thinking he, I, I had really a very different takeaway from all that. I really felt like he really stood up for himself. And, he, you know, he is very constant. He, he hammers on the same points every single time. He ignores what he doesn't want to do. That's perfect as a politician. He has passion. Um, I, I, I actually came away thinking he was, he, was, he was potentially a better candidate against Trump um, on a debate. Now, I, that doesn't translate necessarily into uh, on the votes, you know, on the road when people have a few minutes to reflect on it and whether there's some kind of interesting alternative third party. But um, I, I uh, but it was, it was the, it was without a doubt the best debate I've ever seen in 45 years. And really? you know, Peggy Noonan wrote a great column about it um, saying essentially the same thing in the wall street journal yesterday. And um, you know, it had, it was a different format. So they were allowed to take on each other directly which I think is a really good thing, except it kind of blew up in Amy Klobuchar and, and, and Pete Buttigieg's face there when they almost got, you know, the fisticuffs. And, um, and you, you have Biden standing there thinking, whoa, what's going on here? And he, he had a few good moments. You know, he kind of came across as the elder statesman, but he doesn't... When Amy forgot the name of the Mexican politician, he's like, I'm the only one up here that has met the guy. Like, I thought yeah, that right. was a good it, moment for him. Yeah, it, yeah, right. Except it got passed over by the fight. And, you know, and, <laughs> and, and I, my, I think Pete is, um, he's very interesting. I think he's not quite ready to be president. Um, whatever you think about all the other stuff, he's just, uh, issue-wise, he's, he's just, um, just a little too callow. He, and he's young. smarmy. He, he's smarmy sometimes. The yeah. hard kid who yeah, in your high yeah. school was running for student council president and said all the right things, but was just smarmy. 
Well, and, and Amy Klobuchar may have gone just a little too far when saying, you're so perfect, Pete. That was just a little too much personal peak. Where, where Bloomberg failed, though, where he failed was in telling his own story, which is he tells ter- incredibly well in the ads, and the ads are incredibly well tested, I assure you. Um, but in the ads, you know, it's a guy who, who had nothing as a kid. He went to college. He got fired from his day job. He came up with a, a brilliant idea. He turned it to, into a massive company. And, um, and, you know, and Bernie managed to turn that around. Well, maybe you should get, or Elizabeth, maybe you should, Bernie did, maybe you should give some credit to your workers. Well, he didn't have a lot of workers initially because it was, you know, it was basically a, a digital solution. And with the, with, you know, they put the, the um, computer screens in everybody's office and he, Mike Bloomberg, went around doing the selling. Hmm. And uh, he, what he should have said in that whole thing, uh, when someone, I guess, said, somebody, Bernie said, should Bloomberg, should uh, billionaires exist? And he said, yes. And, and that kind of was a great one word, one liner uh, for a lot of people in the audience, but he could, could also have followed that up appropriately with, you know, um, I've worked my entire life. I had nothing. I inherited nothing, unlike Donald Trump. I made my money by hard work and a great idea. And yes, there were a lot of people who worked with me on it. And we together built a big company and I deserve every penny I took home. And now I'm giving every penny of it away. That's what he should have said. So, uh, and he, he did the same sort of thing, you know, that uh, Trump did on the tax returns, only not so well. And uh, I, I know he'll get them out in a couple of weeks. Uh, if I were he, I'd do everything I can. And I suspect they show up much better than Trump's. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so I thought that it was interesting that capitalism got a tepid applause <laughs> at a Democratic yeah, Party yeah. debate. I mean, yeah. Has that happened in kind of your watching politics over the years? I mean, yeah. where it, it seems to me that that seems like a fundamental thing that Americans were capitalists. We love capitalism. And it was nice to see Bloomberg actually declare that. But it got a tepid applause because Bernie has moved the party so much more towards his side of the things. Uh, well, I, I think people I actually, I think people like, um, I think that people like what uh, capitalism has brought them and the freedom you have inside this system to invent companies and do a, this and that. But I think generationally as people on both ends, both many of the older generation, many of my peers and, and, uh, many in the much younger generation, you know, you, my kids younger, um, see, uh, a lot of the kind of disabilities of the system, uh, right, where people do get left behind, and we all see the tremendous wealth. And why can't we do this instead of doing that? And and the people. So I think the word capitalism, it kind of has a little bit of a jarring effect, um, and that's where Bernie calling it democratic socialism is is. I think he's correct in the way he's positioning it because it's democratic mm. and it's social socialism in the sense of it, it feels, you know, more social <laughs> to a lot of people. Right. I don't think they even know what it means. I think Bloomberg calling it communism was just the beginning of what that's going to show up to be. Um, but I, I think there's also a, a foil in Denmark. They all refer to Denmark and uh, someone in there has to say uh, Denmark is a tiny little country, less than the size of New York City, and it's entirely homogeneous. Um, and uh, and they now are facing their own set of issues with Turkish immigrants and and all of these other folks from the Middle East coming across, and they're facing tremendous issues around uh, violence that they have never experienced before. And and um, so it's it's not all perfect, but it's a lot easier when everybody looks like everybody else. Well, it's the uh, same with healthcare, you know, saying that why well, that's the point. Why, why does Canada why could Canada have healthcare? We can well, Canada has 33 million people and we have 370 million people and That's right. You know, working in the tech industry, you understand the the concept of scale. Yeah. The bigger you scale something, the more complex the problems become. And you look at socialism in Russia through the, United, through the USSR, it's almost hack to say that, but that was a major land spread, lots of different cultures, all trying to be 
governed by a central planning committee and it just didn't work and, and it won't work here. And you can't have a healthcare system with 370 in the same way you can at 300 or 30 million people. It just doesn't work. Yeah. Well, and, and the, well, right. and what has made this country succeed is uh, the fact that we have distributed systems. So we have right. widely distributed government systems, you know, state, federal, and local. The fact that we have 50 states and, and however many territories and all the rest, um, actually is the one thing that allows this country to actually function across the geographies. You know, I think I, I, I uh, referred several times to um, um, Jill Lepore's history book, um, uh, One Volume History of the U.S. And one of the interesting things she talks about is the, is uh, early in the, in the early days of the Republic, uh, people, it was growing so fast that people were afraid that they would lose touch with the, from the east to the west, and we would eventually have to break up. Um, the first non-political newspaper was in the 1820s. Uh, and, uh, before that, all the papers were like the, the British papers, which were all essentially partisan organs, party organs. Uh, and then people thought that would help bring people together, but it wasn't enough. And then you have Samuel Morse and the, and in the 1830s and the stringing across the to the other side of the continent in the 1840s, people thought that would bring us all together because we all had the same information at the same time, <laughs> which it didn't necessarily. And then radio, similar effect, and then TV, uh, where we had um, ABC, CBS, and NBC, all under the equal time doctrine, and the fair, you know, uh, where they had to present both sides. So we were all essentially getting a lot of the same news. And then boom, you got uh, cable explosion and a thousand channels and with a lot of different voices and it's good from one standpoint, which is as a consumer, you can pick what you want, but it's bad because as a consumer, you can pick what you want to hear and what right. you want to believe. And so um, you have these forces back and forth and back and forth all across time. And I think that's what you're seeing in the party conflicts today and uh, the voter and the electorate and, but, you know, the, the, there's still a three, and that's, that was back to this issue of 300 and some million people, uh, 370 million people being different. And we are different. We are much more heterogeneous than any other country on the planet, except maybe the Russians used to be when they were the Soviet Union. And now uh, there's probably no one as heterogeneous as we are. Yeah. So I, I don't. I don't think. I think it's kind of safe to say at this point, just going through the candidates and and people who are probably going to survive the next month, it's probably going to be Bernie, Bloomberg, and maybe Biden. Although Biden seems like he's kind of on his last legs. You know, Mayor Pete never really gets above fifteen percent. Amy uh, and, and Elizabeth Warren are kind of uh, they're there, but they're they're splitting the vote a little bit, and uh, you know. So let's focus on Bernie Bloomberg and let's yeah, say, and I think Steyer has just got to drop out. That's ridiculous. Yeah. So well, part of what Bloomberg is doing, and part of why I say that is Bloomberg is waging a war of attrition. So he is forcing these candidates to spend money in places that they weren't yeah. ready to spend money, places like California or yeah. Florida or other places or Texas. You know, Bernie's in Texas today, and yeah. it's because Bloomberg is spending so much money, so much damn money that you know bernie is having to spend money and it's going to burn through those smaller campaigns so much quicker and their name id is the most important in my opinion the most important factor in, a, in an election well that that's my point about that was my point earlier about bernie and the, about the bloomberg and the money you go into this super tuesday it's really literally going to be about advertising i yeah. i think um I, I will say that that um Biden has his whole operation on the line next week in South Carolina since he's been saying he's going to win big there. So he sort of has to. And if he doesn't, I think he's out too. Yeah. So it's Bernie and Bloomberg. I mean, let's go back to the brokered convention. Do you think Bernie can mm -hmm. just run away with this thing? Or do you think Bloomberg can, you know, and Biden, I, I heard an interesting take on Jake Tapper today where Rick Santorum basically said something I hadn't thought of, like, Biden saying I can win in southern states, but if you're in an electoral college fight, who cares if you can win in Alabama? Trump's going to carry that. Like, well, that's you right. Need to win in Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Bernie can make the claim that he can do that the best, or Bloomberg can. Um, so I just don't think that Biden, his whole appeal. Well, is that's where I think, though, I, I do think the election is going to be won up there in the Midwest. 
the, the general. And that's where I think their best ticket is probably Biden and Klobuchar. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and, and I do think she did hit the mayor on Mayor Pete on several of his vulnerabilities. One is he was the mayor of a teeny weeny little town and uh, all of that. So, yeah, and he's a little callow. So, so uh, uh, although Bernie, smart, really smart and well-informed. Yeah. I've, I've, I've been impressed with her. Um, so Bernie and Biden or Bernie and Bloomberg, I mean, excuse me. Yeah. Who, who can beat Trump? Can either of them beat Trump? Mm, good question. I, I think depending on how, I think Bloomberg could um, put together much more easily a ticket and a campaign that could beat Trump than Bernie can. Um, if Bernie gets the nomination, the question is, and he might do what Reagan did, which is pick somebody in advance, that would be what he would have to do um, for VP, who would signal to the party that he was willing to at least tip his hat to the middle. So that again would be Amy Klobuchar or, or Elizabeth Warren. Well, he wouldn't do Warren. You know, she would just reinforce the socialism thing. Uh, could, uh, he wouldn't do Biden. Uh, um, uh, who knows, maybe he'd pick Bloomberg. Um, but it would depend entirely on his tactics at the election as to whether he even had a shot. But I, again, I will say, I thought he and Elizabeth Warren uh, were terrific in the debate, notwithstanding that I'd sat there saying, well, hit her back with this or hit him back with that, you know, and what a stupid argument. But it was so, um, it was, both were uh, heartfelt, strong emotional appeals and simple, simple, simple messages, which is what you want in a, in a debate. Um, I will say Warren exhibited, whether it's true or not, uh, a lot of nimbleness in the way she attacked Bloomberg. And um, I know all of that was prepared. You can't believe that anything wasn't pre-tested before any of them went into the, to the uh, debate, which is why it is so, that his, his performance was so pathetic in that respect. Um, um, his, um, and his history, you know, they've, they've done a, a, I saw last week there, there was a professor from somewhere who had gone back to look at all of Bloomberg's debate tapes. And he, he really, he says he's most passionate, uh, when he's talking about the American dream and this and that, and when he can talk about himself having done this and done that and done this, but he is, he is passionate, he is essentially dispassionate and that, works against him in a debate like this. And he's a logical, intelligent guy, but I'm sure there's a lot of running around right now trying to figure out how to play the parts of all of the other uh, people in the debate. And, you know, I've, I've said before, I played the part of George Bush uh, Sr. In, in the run-ups to uh, preparing him for his debates. And what we did was we put together uh, a Bob Dole and, a, you know, and, and all of the other candidates, someone knew their records and, 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 and looked at and watched them for style. And then, um, and then I had to be George Bush so they could practice against me. Uh, and this would have been in, uh, in uh, 19, what year was that? 1987. And um, in, fa in fact, it was so realistic that uh, I was asked a question at some point, and uh, well, what would you do about this or that energy policy? And I gave, gave some answer, and everybody in the group playing Dole and and uh, and and uh, you know Governor uh, what's his name from Texas say he can't possibly say that. that. That's he would never say that. Well, the next day, of course, was the the, the actual practice with George H. W. Bush. And the question came up and he said exactly what I said, which I knew he would because <laughs> I, I had written his papers and I studied his words and I turned them into speeches. And <laughs> so, but, so, so they're that, bound to be ask, doing let, that. They're bound to be doing one. that. Yeah. But let me I ask think they got a taste question. of blood. Yeah. So in these debate prep, prep practices, so you guys have a debate practice for the stand-ins and then you do the, the debate with the candidates? Well, that was certainly the way we did it. And I'm sure it was done um, the rest of the time in other Republican um, uh, preparation. I don't know if the Democrats do it that way or not. I, I, do, say, I do think that um, uh, that requires a lot of 
resources to be able to do that, uh, personnel resources. I, I doubt that, um, that uh, I, I'd be surprised that Bloomberg's doing that, uh, but he should be. So I have never really seen debate performances. Uh, everybody's, you know, on the, on the talking head shows this morning going, oh, that was such a bad debate performance. He's over. He's over. I don't think that it matters. I mean, Donald Trump had one of the worst debate performances in history in that first debate, and he still yeah. won the presidency. So Absolutely. I don't necessarily know that the Bloomberg debacle the other night is necessarily going to, to hurt him, not with regular people who probably didn't even watch the debate. No, I think that's right. I, I think you're among only a handful of people that I know personally who actually watched it. Uh, I, my wife watched like five minutes and went to bed. <laughs> <laughs> All these are at like 9 p.m. And, and I get invited on uh, another libertarian podcast for their debate recap. And it's always at 11 p.m. And I'm like, I get up at 530. I, I yeah, can't sorry, that. guys. So do I. Yeah. Well, you know, um, but, uh, but again, w w the reason it is important it's because of the inter intermediary interpreters, meaning um, the talking heads and the next morning, the newspapers and, and all of that. Although, you know, I noted this morning in the Times and the, the Post that uh, I, uh, I don't think there's a whole lot about Bloomberg and his debate performance five days ago now. It's now on to Biden and how the other people have to concentrate on Bernie mm. and stop attacking Bloomberg. And uh, frankly, for their own good, that's what they should do. Because um, I do think, like you, it's it's likely to come down to Bloomberg and and Bernie, um, uh, unless Biden can pull it out this week. And you and I should be talking uh, uh, in about two weeks. <laughs> yeah, what's coming up? It's going to be a lot of water over this dam. I think nobody that I have seen is talking about because the media just won't ex they won't say this out loud how good the trump campaign is and will be and how much they've learned over the last four years it was a you know slipshot operation in 2016 and they squeaked by on accident breaking every fundamental but i think by because they broke every fundamental principle of political science is led to a campaign now that embraces that as their doctrine and I don't know that Democrats are giving consideration to the fact that Bernie Sanders had his own TV show in the 70s and 80s and yeah. Russia. Yeah. And there yeah. is an enormous amount of tape on this guy because he was an OG podcaster back in the day. Like I could never run for president because I've done things I may have said in 2012 or 2013. Uh, it's out there and it exists. And Brad Pascal and the Donald Trump campaign are not going to be afraid to pull every stop out, put up an Instagram ad of Bernie Sanders in Russia or talking about Cuban. I don't think that anybody in the media is talking about how good the campaign will be in terms of destroying the credibility of Bernie Sanders and Michael Bloomberg because of the amount of stuff that's out there. And that is one factor. Now, Trump is always the person who takes two steps forward and three steps backward because he screws himself up. Yeah. But yeah. I, think, I think that the Democrats are just, they're, they're going into this like 2016. He can't possibly win. We just need to nominate anybody. Howard Dean's like, oh, this is in the bag this morning. And I'm like, you guys right. are idiots. <laughs> Their campaign is brutal, and they're going to fight nasty. And Bernie Sanders is the worst one that you guys could put up. But I will say they can come together. There's plenty of time. Uh, a lot can happen in a single day in a presidential campaign. Yeah. And, and so the reality is they, um, as brutal as it is now, it doesn't mean they can't win, uh, you know, and it's happened before. So it's not like it's the first time it would ever happen. Right. Yeah. So, um, so there are a lot of things happening this week. Obviously, we, you know, Barr, uh, Trump's going to India this week. Um, he's promising. He said Modi has promised him 10 million people for an audience and the stadium holds 175,000 isn't completed. Uh, but he'll probably get a bunch on the streets. Um, and of course, the interesting thing about that is that we don't exactly have a good relationship with India right now. <laughs> so it's no trade agreement. We slapped massive tariffs on them. Um, so it'd be interesting to see how the, that all plays out. And uh, 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 bars. Let, let, let's go back surviving. to the bar thing. Yeah, because I want to ask you, I have not totally followed the Roger Stone, Bill Barr, Donald Trump stuff. I know that they sentenced Roger Stone. They didn't run it up the flagpole to the Justice Department, and they 
the bar or, or Trump or somebody felt that he, Roger Stone was over sentenced and re, was reduced from seven to three years. What, what exactly happened and why? So, is so, if, so if you get past all the histrionics, um, uh, Trump tweeted that, uh, well, what happened was somehow it leaked out that the prosecutors were going to recommend seven to nine years, the, the local guys. And then the next thing you know, you have a tweet. And then um, the next thing you have is um, the prosecutor's recommendation is overridden by the Justice Department at the top, which is that's t too much for what he did and inconsistent. And then, um, and then Barr says that he had already decided that. And, um, and there are an awful lot of people in the legal profession who would agree with him that that was um, overreaching. Uh, and who knows, it might have been overturned by the judge. Um, my understanding is that procedurally, the local guys are supposed to run that up the flagpole of the department. And that's not just symbolic. The department has to decide whether that's what they want to go for. Um, uh, and in the end, he got, uh, I think, two and a half years. Um, and uh, he's got time to put everything in order. And I suspect he's going to get stay out for a while. I think they'll probably grant him a, a retrial. Um, and so. So we'll see on that, but it looks bad. And that's where Barr made the remark that uh, Trump makes his job impossible by his tweets, because in the absence of that, um, uh, it, Barr would have reduced the recommendation, uh, overridden the prosecutors, and then uh, it, there wouldn't have been a whole lot of flap about it. It would have been some, but not quite as much. Now it, it looks the like fact Trump. that the head of the Justice Department, Donald Trump, basically yeah. looked like he was interfering in what is supposed to be. Yeah, well, and, as, and then Trump went out and said he was a chief law enforcement officer of the United States. So <laughs> in a lot of ways he is. He's, it's not his job, but his job is to see that the laws of the land are faithfully executed, you know, if you look at the oath. So it's, it's not that he is the literal chief law enforcement officer, but he's the chief person in charge of seeing the laws are enforced. So he's, he's uh, rhetorically um, close. And, but it, it's the kind of stuff that would make Barr's life difficult. And I, I don't know if I think Barr will stay. I think he probably will. I think they've got an understanding, I suspect. Yeah, the the you know Dennis, who's on our podcast regularly, says, "Oh, he he was just chosen because he's Trump's wingman. Like Holder was Obama's wingman, and that's yeah. he was there to to defend him from the Mueller investigation. He's not truly independent, which is maybe why he said Trump's tweets are making my job impossible. But you don't see many administration officials be critical of Trump and and kind of survive that. Well, so I that's that right. Was interesting. Well, and then we." Kind of the flip side of that is the impact of Trump on his own nominee, his own people, as we, we uh, have the former attorney general running for the Senate nomination down now in Mississippi. Is that right, Mississippi? Um, uh, Alabama. Ab Alabama, right. Well, you know, they all look the same, even though I'm a Southerner. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, you know, Jeff Sessions. And be interesting to see what happens with that one too, or if Trump can keep his nose out of it long enough to let the voters have a say. But Roger Stone is usually he throws these people under the bus, but I think because Stone has been so virulent in his defense of Trump at every step and on Infowars hosting his own show and talking about how great Donald Trump is, that's why Donald Trump feels the the duty to to help Stone who shepherded his other two presidential campaigns or encouraged them get me roger stone on netflix is yeah. a great documentary i've met stone a couple times he has a he has a head like a spade shovel i mean it's just yeah i know you ever see it he, he, yeah. well and for those who don't know him he has a full-size tattoo of richard nixon on his back <laughs> and, and that was his first major candidate um and uh now intelligently and i think someone had to have gotten to trump he he said yesterday i think uh, asked if he would interfere. He said, no, no, no. I think he's going to win his appeal. So we'll just see how it plays out. So I had, that's I had a vaguely, much better, but much better position to be in. I had, I had heard vaguely that like the head juror on the, the foreman of the jury hated Stone and hated Trump. And that that's the grounds that he'll get it overturned. And so I don't, I, I have not dove deep, but if you're interested in any of this, you can look into all that stuff. But uh, yeah. Now it's time to transition to our favorite part of the program. <laughs> restaurants. Uh, Rob Cortell is, uh, he loves restaurants as much, probably more than I do. 
and he's <laughs> fortunate to live in one of the great food cities in the United States. It's known for its politics, but the food is pretty great in Washington, D.C. And so he likes to give us the Diner's Guide to D.C. and tell us where's a good place to eat or get a drink or visit if you're going to the nation's capital, which you should because it's an amazing place to visit. Uh, so what, what are your recommendations for uh, our for audience? food? Like, well, before I get to that, I'm going to tell you, I've just put myself on a keto diet. Oh. Um, I came back from a week-long trip to California uh, <laughs> where I had – more weight than I've ever had in my entire life. And I decided I had to be radical about this. Uh -huh. so I'm not drinking as much as, as uh, and only, only eating certain things, but I have three good recommendations, but you, you'll find quickly this. The reason for the trip is that the national science foundation gives out $50,000 grants to research scientists to help them um, learn how to bring a good idea to market. And as we all know, good ideas don't always make good companies. So they, I went with this team from Virginia Tech, which has a technology that uh, matches wine grapes to the right soil and vice versa, and wow. has climatological data on top to project five, seven, 10 years in the future. Is that grape still gonna survive in that climate as the climate changes? And, uh, and so some, some people may be climate deniers, but not grape growers. <laughs> wine growers. <laughs> so I've spent the last four or five weeks uh, interviewing a lot of vineyards with them. They have to do a hundred customer interviews. But um, so there, there have been the three really terrific restaurants that are pretty new. Um, one is uh, the first Burmese restaurant in Washington. It's called Tame, T-H-A-M-E-E. -E, and it's really kind of a combination of Indian and Thai and Chinese um, uh, flavors and all that. <laughs> Fantastic. Definitely, you know, a couple stars. I and live. I live, and uh, here's a weird connection. I live in the number two most populated uh, location on Earth for Burmese, in Southport, Indiana. That is where most Chin, who are political refugees, have settled mm -hmm. here or in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And so my local grocery store went from a Marsh grocery, which was like Kroger, to uh, Vietnamese Burmese. Uh, <laughs> grocery store it is massive there are squid and bugs and things that i've never seen in my life and i'm surrounded by <laughs> well, we, restaurants i need to go well you have to go next time but we had the most fabulous duck and hmm. uh the, the the mother of the of the who the mother of the operation is also she's burmese and is a chef as well and and it's run by her son or daughter-in-law or something but they have another very successful restaurant uh, also in DC, but this one's great. Uh, second one is called Emily's, and we've been trying to get there for quite a while. And that's a um, um, very, 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 very good and creative chef, um, Asian young Asian chef. But uh, Piesta Resistance is a new uh, restaurant that has opened in a new little boutique hotel, the Thompson Hotel, across the street from where I'm now living in DC, where where my apartment is, where I am a couple days a month. And uh, Danny Meyer, who is one of the most famous chefs on the planet and uh, began in Chicago and has a fabulous restaurants all around and one in New York, has opened what the name of Maialano Mare, M-A-I-A-L-A-N-O -I -I Mare, and it's Italian. And uh, the chef came down from his New York restaurant of the same name. Her name is Rose. And they have a fantastic welcoming staff and it's a beautiful restaurant. Um, and uh, I will say that the food is just impeccable and you would think it would be incredibly expensive uh, by Washington standards, it's not. And one of the most interesting things is they don't uh, allow tipping. So the tip is built into your, your uh, the price. So uh, of everything from the, the, the wine and the drinks and the, pasta and, and the seafood but so uh, I would rec I, I've been recommending to my friends that they they that's that's their special occasion restaurant but because it's across the street I now end up eating breakfast there a fair amount so, <laughs> so is the tip is it just like hey where well, you're paying 20 percent whether you like it or not or is it just like they don't you even know, tell you who, that you who tip knows it? who knows what your actual tip is you know I, I typically just double the bill mm -hmm. and uh, and do 20, it actually ends up at about 22%, uh, unless I'm ticked off. And, 
and uh, <laughs> I try not to eat at restaurants again that I'm ticked off and I try to distinguish between the waiter or waitress and, and the food. And um, so I'm guessing it's probably in the 18 to 20 percent range, but um, and they share this all. They share profits with the, the staff and, and they seem very happy about it. Although uh, the funny reaction of other restaurants that the bartenders and the waitresses at other comparable restaurants say, oh, that won't last long. They just don't make so much money. I make so much more money in tips and blah, 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 blah. Hmm. But um, I, I suspect it, it will last. And Danny Meyer has plenty of creds to do it. But it's a fantastic restaurant, Milano Marais. Interesting. Okay. And it's right on, and we're on the water uh, in, in DC in, in uh, uh, the ballpark area there. So. Great. And was there a third or is that the third? That's the third. So okay. Emily's, okay. Emily's, okay. Uh, Tom A, the Burmese and Mylana Murray. Excellent. All right, Rob, it's always great to talk to you. This great. was a great conversation and we appreciate your time so much. And, and we next week it. I'll come back. Uh, next time I'll be 20 pounds lighter. You will. Oh, this keto thing is no joke. Like I, <laughs> 15 I tried, pounds anyway. I tried to survive it. I lost 10 pounds in the four weeks that I did it. But then I was just like, I want a cheeseburger and I don't, I want the bun. <laughs> I just couldn't do it. Um, all right. Well, thanks so much for joining. All right. And I appreciate it. A couple of weeks. All right. Let's talk after Super Tuesday and yeah. uh, get, get uh, some perspective there. All right. Thanks all right. for listening to We Are Libertarians and we will talk to you next week. <laughs>